the Mad K Studio Show. Hey, everybody. Mad K Studio Podcast. Welcome back. I have a very special guest today that I'm glad to know. Um, here's a guy that I met in Sturgis in 2020 at our Ciro uh, booth out at, at Rapid City Harley Davidson at the Black Hills Harley dealership. And he had come in and I was on one end of the tent. You had your bike. You were working on some other stuff, ha- having some stuff done. And uh, we just got talking and uh, I didn't really realize who you were because I didn't recognize you. But this is Matt Bradley. Um, a lot of people know him from the Deadliest Catch, the Discovery Channel show, uh, which I watched. Between that and Ice Road Truckers, man, I binged for years. I mean, it was just a, <laughs> it's had a great run. So it's really cool. So thanks for being here. Um, when we met at Sturgis in 2020, it was uh, kind of the middle of the pandemic where everyone lost their minds. And it was kind of the breaking <laughs> point for me where I was like, you know what? I don't think we're all going to die. Look at all these people. There was It was the one piece of normalcy in the whole summer. And um, I really appreciated that. And you felt the same way. And my son was there. He got to meet you, too, which was pretty Good cool. Kid. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And uh, so I appreciate you coming on. So thanks for being here. You're welcome, Ken. And like you said, you know, that that meeting up there, like we literally had rode from Seattle, Washington out to Sturgis that year. And all I wanted was a cup holder. So like day two at Sturgis, I'm going to Black Hills Harley to the Ciro booth to buy the cup holder. It was, I mean, it was a hot summer. We had some hundred degree days riding over there. And like I kept cramming water bottles down the side of my saddlebag. And then I lost a couple of them. It was like, yeah, just want the cup holder. And then we got to chat and, 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 you know, like yourself and your whole team and Darren and, and the rest of the sales team, there, just super good people. Oh, that's great. No, we appreciate it. And, you know, one of the things we were talking about is just the way that, um, you know, everyone's just a, a biker at that point when you come into the booth and when you're talking to us, I'm not, I don't make this mean this to make a big, this is a big zero <laughs> ad. It's not, not my intention, but um it really, it makes a difference when you, when you've talked to people just, you know, on that level, I, I wanted to hear your trip from Washington. I wanted to hear what that was like. Cause we had some hot days, man. I think it was 104, 104 degrees one day. And there was another group that rode out from Washington, the law abiding biker group. Yeah. And, that's, uh, that's another good group of people. Yeah. Good, good group of guys. And they were there too. And um, I think that that one day that was super hot, that, that was the day they had their, um, their Patreon group ride. And they all went to like a 50 mile trip or a hundred mile trip around the area in the black Hills, just baking. So that was, that was pretty funny, but uh, yeah. So anyway, we got talking about that and I found out um, some of your story. Um, you know, I was, I was fangirling a little bit because I was meeting someone from one of my favorite shows. So that was pretty cool. And uh, but when, the more I talked to you, the more you kind of discuss, told me like your story and your, in your past. Um, I was like, wow, there's, there's a lot more to this than, than I wanted to know. And you and me have, have stayed somewhat in touch um, the last seven or eight months, not as much, but for quite a while we did. And um, you were telling me about some of the, the trials and tribulations from, from um, your life. So maybe start a little bit on how you got, because the story of how you got into the fishing is pretty interesting. So if you could uh, let us know a little bit about that, you know, where did you start? When I first started, uh, you know, again, this is Matt Bradley from Deadliest Catch. I've, uh, I've appeared on season one through season 17. Um, it's hard telling if I'll be a part of season 18. They just they just got done with some filming for it. So there is the January season, and there's an option for me to go up for that. But the amount of crab that were allotted to catch this year, I don't know if the wife's going to let me go on a financial end. It's just not really worth it. And on a bigger scale of life, I got more things to worry about here at home than going up, trying to make a couple of bucks. And and I'm not going to lie, man. Like I I really miss being out there. I miss the camaraderie of my crew and, and, and just being out on the water. It's definitely God's country out there. So I can see that. Your, your question, you know, like, how did I get started? I grew up on this side of the railroad tracks. So all little rich kids were down here. And, and uh, you know, honestly, all the little rich kids' dads own crab boats. And hmm. I started rigging pots for them in the summertime. The boats had come down. And, and I can remember that first time uh, Captain Sig 
kept razzing me one night in the bar. We weren't even old enough to be in the bar. It was just a local bar here in Seattle, having a couple of beers. And uh, Edgar's or Sig's brother Edgar kept going, I think he's testing you. And I said, he's, he's <laughs> testing me far enough. I'm about to break this long neck over his head. And he's like, my brother's really tough. You shouldn't do that. And I said, well, we'll find out when I catch him off guard. <laughs> and, and he was, you know, in the end, he was just testing me, just seeing how far he could needle me. Right, and right. He got me a job on a on a boat, and I went up like four days later. I did a five-and-a-half-month season. I got $100 a day for every day we fished. Mm -hmm. um, so if we were running to town for two days, no pay. If we were in town for five days, no pay. So there was like 10, 12 days out of every month minimum that I wasn't getting paid. And right. I was still working 12, 18, 20 hour days, even when we were in town. All I wanted to do was finish my contract. And, you know, because I'm not a quitter, right? I'm not going right. to drag up on something. And uh, I finished out the season and the captain said, hey, kid, you did a good job. Why don't you go down and talk to John? A couple of boats down tied up. And uh, one of his guys had just got injured and uh He'll, he'll probably hire you. So I went down. I said, I don't know anything. i just been on this boat over here for five months. And he says, uh -huh. you're hired. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that was one of the things I thought about. How do you how do you train for that? Or is it just it's really just pretty much apprenticeships where yeah. you, you've grown up around it. And um, and at some point you just make the leap to jump on the boat and then you're the low man on the totem pole and they, they work you up from there. Is that, is that yeah, pretty, pretty close much. to it? You start out as the greenhorn and, you know, some guys pick it up faster than others. There's some that like, it's just, this is not the occupation for you. You know, <laughs> you know, uh, watch deadliest catch and you shouldn't have never phoned up here. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like you just shouldn't have go retail sales might be a better option for you. Right. Or, right. You know, go flip some burgers or dig ditches, but this ain't cut out. This ain't the business for you. You got to love it. I'd imagine you have to just, you have to want to do that. It's and even definitely if, a, a love hate relationship. <laughs> right, that's what I was going to say. It was right. You hate it at times. I mean, um, I've never done anything like that. You know, I've been to Alaska many times. My sister's lived in Anchorage since the mid seventies. And, um, you know, I've been out on the water, I've been up in the mountains and it's just, it's a tougher life. It's just a, it, it's tough. My hat is off to every man and woman and child that lives in the state of Alaska. It's, it's a different, it is definitely different up there. And no, I've been all whole, over. <laughs> yeah, I know it is. The whole, the, the culture of it everywhere is, is really, we used to run, my dad's a musician and he used to uh, be the director of the Fairbanks Summer Arts Festival. So it's a big music and arts festival in Fairbanks every year. Right. And uh, so we went up there through, all through this, from the early seventies, all the way through the late eighties, we'd go up every summer, you know, and run this thing. And so I got to see a lot of Alaska and, right. um, you know, we, he'd go up to, uh, I still got, I, I just moved and I found it a white Arctic Fox pelt. So he's up oh, in, right he's up in Nome and there's a, there's a taxi driver in Nome that was driving him around. And uh, he's like, Hey, you want to, you, you want a, a, a pelt? So the guy opens his <laughs> trunk, you know, and he's, he's got all these, these animal pelts back One there. Foxes in there. <laughs> two walrus heads, you know, it's completely illegal, but he had two walrus heads in there. If you want the tusks and it all, I mean, it was, this was back in like 1985, 86. Yeah but pretty crazy. We bought this Fox home. How much we, has changed in that? <laughs> yeah, no, I can't imagine not. And the Fox just stank. We hung it in the, in the, uh, in the, in the living room, you hung it up on the wall and oh, it just reeked. Our cat went nuts on it and went and attacked it. It was funny, but you know, it's a different world. It's, yeah. just, it's a whole different world up there. And I can see why my sister lives up there. Cause uh, you know, that's her thing. I had uh in these, I guess it was about seven or eight years ago. We finally get, can actually send a text message with a picture from Alaska. This is new technology. We just, we're just now getting into the video things. Like there's right. just not enough bandwidth to do what we're doing right now up there. There is on the boat, but we pay dearly for it. It's like four grand a month for, for it, bet. but I got a funny Fox pill. So I send a couple of pictures home to my wife. I have a total of five daughters mm -hmm. and I wanted to get them all some Fox pelts. And I get back this, you're horrible, dad. No. <laughs> I was like, yeah. 
they're a couple hundred bucks a piece. The hides are tanned really nice. Yeah. They'll look cool in each one of your rooms. It's a full head, eye sockets, all the they're yeah. the whole bit. No dad. Yeah. I don't want no dead animals hanging on the wall. I was like, well, I'm gonna get one for myself. And they're all no. So I <laughs> you still don't have one. an Alaska fox belt because of the girls. Oh, that's hilarious. That's pretty funny. So yeah, I, that whole area up there. So you know that the, the the sea, the, the, the country, you know, Canada, Alaska, and that whole area up there. So as you were going through um, and dealing with the, the waters and, you know, watching the show, what, of course, they're going to show the, the most dynamic things that are happening, the big waves and stuff like that. And being, I'm from Boston originally, and, you know, we go out whale watching and, and do that kind of thing. And we've been, there's been times you get caught in some heavy seas, but it's nothing like you get up there. And uh, so watching these, these, these boats dive right into the wave in the bottom and crash over. It's just, I'm blown away that like you would go up there a second time. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I don't, I don't have the set. In, for that. in the beginning, I got a, I'll just say I got addicted to the money. I mean, that second sure. trip I did, we went out, we were a trawl boat. I went from fishing a paleo crab to going and trawling for Pollock and cod. And uh, the first tow we did, we set the net out, tow it behind us for three, four hours. We pull it up and we got to bleed all these fish. And the guys that I'm working with are all jazz. They're all excited. I'm learning. Right. You know, I'm, why are they so happy? And we finish that bag of fish and the next one's already out. The guys are like, hey, kid, you know, you just made like $900. Wow. Like, what? I just made $900? <laughs> getting up with like two and a half percent the full share on that boat was five you know wow like these guys just made like 1800 bucks i just made i'm so happy too <laughs> and well what 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 were you actually doing though so like in the beginning is the greenhorn the new guy in the boat what was i what stuffed were... a, i stuffed a bait bag for a hundred dollars oh. a day i filled these little jars uh -huh. full of herring and then i would hang as much fish as i could pick up with one hand two or three fish and I would hang it in the pot and I would run away from the pot because they'd all be screaming at me, get away from there. You dumb kid. All right. All right. All right. You're going to die. I'm, okay. You know, and I did, that. Out of you. I did that for two seasons. Mm -hmm. I was the bait boy. The second season I kind of was like, this sucks. I don't want to do this all day. <laughs> yeah. So I'd get up an hour before everybody else. And I get everything ready for the first three hours of the day. And then I would learn different dynamics of the deck. Sure. Like, hey, my job's done because that's all I had to do was bait. And then I would land pots and, and learn how to do other stuff. So. Sure. No, I get I, I see how that would work. So you just kind of, you know, going from station to station as you work through. So yeah. what what is the what do you get to be um not not financially, but what kind of when you when you're you got your full share? What, yeah, that's the what, correct term. What um you know what what are the tasks that you do there? So if, Usually they're, if they're when you can tie, when you can tie all your knots and you can run the hydraulics and sometimes like, it's just better that maybe Ken runs the crane cause we're in bad weather. And, and I'll be honest, uh, I don't run the crane that often. I can, mm -hmm. but I don't like to, I have a, I can't see out of my left eye. So I have no depth perception. Oh yeah. That'd so be I can run all the other hydraulics and bring pots over the rail and all that stuff. But, if you ever watch the show, there's a little fun fact that I don't normally share with interviews and whatnot is uh, I got amblyopia in my left eye when I was a kid and, and mm -hmm. it just, uh, my vision deteriorated down to about nothing out of my left eye. So wow. having no depth perception, I can't tell if it's six feet or four feet once it's past that 30 foot mark. So right. stacking pots when it's close, I can tell, but when they're back there on the stern, I'm all, where, ah. Yeah, because how long? How long is that? Is that that boat? No, <laughs> right. <laughs> like, are you? No, nah, it's in place. Tie it down. It's fine. <laughs> so, like the uh, like, I'll say that um, the the saga and the Northwestern they both similar size boat. It's hard to tell. Watch on TV how, no, how the, big they're. The Northwestern, the Northwestern is 127 feet long. Okay, and we have about 65 feet of deck, 70 okay. feet of deck, where the saga is 120 feet, and you only have 
oh God, there's maybe 45 feet of deck space in length. And then I don't know what she is. I don't know what the beam of that rig is. Small. Right. But still <laughs> like take it. Take... When we're stacking, we can stack like 60 pots behind the crane. The saga, we get 10 on deck and then everything has to go up from there. Sure. Oh, and I can see how that's, that's, that's quite a ways away. Yeah. You know, 40, 60 feet when you're lifting something up and trying to drop it down, that's... And the boat, that's not easy. Yeah, and the, 20, the boat's moving degrees. too. You're going up and down 18, <laughs> 20 feet. And yeah, you don't want that running the wrecking ball at that point. Man, <laughs> yeah, I could see that. Well, it's a, it's been a great run of that show. I tell you what, I mean, it's it, uh... it's insane. I mean, we started out as a documentary. They figured it would run three years after the first year, then right. it went five. Here we are, seventeen years later. And a huge chunk of my life is very well documented. Yeah. No, you know? that's pretty interesting. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk about too, was the, the amount of life that you documented. There's a lot of part of your life that you didn't see and struggles that you had and that you, that you're overcome and you're, you know, consistently overcoming. So I wonder if there's something, if we could talk about that a little bit. Sure. And, you know, like, uh, I call, uh, commercial fishing has been my saving grace and it's also been my demise. You know, um, I went through a lot of years, my twenties, all the way through my thirties, you know, I go up and make a lump sum, might have 50,000 in cash by the time the season's done, you know, right. Or I'd stay up there and make a goal for myself, a hundred thousand or seven months, whichever comes first, Mm -hmm. you know, and Sometimes that money came before that seventh month ran around and I'd be sending all the checks home or I'd just come home to a stack of checks and then I'd be off and running, you know, and I'm pretty open about it. Even on that first day we met, you know, I introduced myself as a recovering addict and hopes that it might, might help someone else, you know, like I was saying, you know, you, you know, I thought every, almost every time I went up, things are going to be different when I come home, I'm just going to party for a couple of weeks. And right. uh, the weeks would turn into months. The months would turn into a second month. And now I'm broke and it's time for another season, you know? Right. I would play harder than I worked, you know? Um, and when I say fishing was my blessing and my demise and the same, you know, about the time the house that I might be getting high in, um, just a basic trap house, you go in, you just never leave, you know? Right. The drugs are being brought in all day long. It would get raided and I'd just miss a raid or everyone I was running with was going to prison or getting busted yeah. and on their way to prison. And it, I'd be broken out of money and out of hustle and go back on the boat and go be gone for five, six months. So if the cops were looking for me, this yeah, is the left not, part. They're not going to find you. About. Right. Yeah, they couldn't find me. I'd be in Alaska. I'd be dodging a couple of warrants, and you know, so they, there was there was pluses and minuses to it. You know, it filled my drug addiction, and it also saved me from it because I get away just long enough to get healthy. You know, right? Because I can't imagine there was much on the boat that you'd. I mean, you wouldn't. You know, it's the it's the one place I never used. Right. You know, when it was time to go to work, that's what it was. I'm not saying we weren't drinking and partying a little bit here and there in town right, but for right. the most part it wasn't it wasn't everyday use you know and that's well, where i was at before that in and having talked with other addicts and stuff i've had some good friends I, the guitarist in my band that i used to be in um he got clean and then went back down to texas and ended up being a hospital administrator down there got a really good job with the keys to what the keys to the pharmacy oh, medical <laughs> ended up ended up killing him you know, six months later, he was dead. He was making 250 grand a year, administering a hospital, incredibly great guitar player. And he was dead. And, you know, and then there's other people that I've known that have been able to maintain. I did an interview about a year ago with Mike Lindell, actually, the My Pillow guy. Oh, and yeah, yeah. His story is incredible. I mean, he was still heavily using on crack when he started the My Pillow company. And, um, you know, ended up working his way through and his story about how his dealer, one of his dealers pulled him aside and said, you're going down the wrong path, man. You got to stop. I mean, his dealer was like, you're, 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 you got to, you my can't friends do this. Be like, bro, you can't, I could have a pile of dope and they'd be like, no, you can't be here. You're too out of control and you're better than this. And I used to, 
like being in active addiction and having people that you're using with be like, you're out of control. You know, how am I? Yeah. Out of control? You're sitting next to me with the same substances in your hand, you know, like right. how, how am I more out of control than you? But no, I, it was I, a, a key denominator in my life back then. I found myself when I was in college, I went to Minneapolis uh, College of Art and Design, it was art school in Minneapolis in the 90s, or late 80s, early 90s. And, um, you know, there was a lot of pot everywhere. And it was, you know, it's art school. So it was, an, it was every day, you know, and it just got to a point with me where I was just, I'd get, I'd get so, uh, I stopped laughing. And I started getting more and more paranoid and then started worrying about what this person was going to do and what that person's going to do. And looking at the people I was hanging out with because that they had the, you know, they had the bot. And um, eventually I, I was able to like, by myself come to the point of like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And I just stopped and it was, you know, I stopped smoking cigarettes the same way, but that was 30 years later. <laughs> but that was a lot harder. Yeah. But, yeah. So I, I never had the real hardcore addiction, but I got to the point where I was like, you know, that's what I, all you want to do is just party. And, um, you know, you, you end up finding friends and people that are around you that are, that's what they want to do. And when I was seeing other friends do the same thing, like they weren't saying, Oh, you're out of control, but I would watch them. Oh no, I can't come over and do this tonight. Cause I got a thing I'm working on. I'm working on this project or I got an interview or, and I didn't have any of that. I was just partying. And, um, you know, that really led me down a, a pretty crappy path for probably 10 years. And thank God I'm out of it. And I do thank God that I'm out of it. I mean that quite literally. And uh, that's one of the things that, you know, I'd like to ask you about too, because I know that that you're, you're a man of faith too. So I, I never had faith until I got into politics. This is crazy. But <laughs> I got into politics in right after uh, 2009, after the, the healthcare bill went through, I thought I was like, that's it. I've watched Fox News. Hannity says I should do something. I'm going to go do something. What an idiot I was. I mean, I was just completely <laughs> just watch Fox News. And that was my whole scope of knowledge. You know? that's, that's it. No and, worries, and so, so I started getting involved and, and, and did stuff. And, and um, I found an emptiness there, a real just emptiness in the politics. And I got talking to some of the people that were the kind of the, the, the religious right, the people normally that would have driven me crazy because I never darkened a door in a church since I was baptized in 1968, you know. And um, she's like, why don't you come to my church and check it out? And I went and uh, checked it out. And I left there thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. Or I started during the mat, the, the, it was an evangelical church. You know, it was a rock band and I went to stand up and sing in this hands in the air and stuff. And I'm like, this is really culty. Is this like branch Davidian shit here? Or what am I doing? <laughs> and, and, uh, but by the end of it, I was like choked up. I had tears running down my face and I was something, something is here. And I found through that church, it was the Constance free church and, in Andover, Minnesota, I'll give him a and Pastor Randy Dishler up there. He really took me under his wing as a person that I didn't know. Like I had to ask him, where do you get a Bible? What's a ministry? I'd never read it. I didn't, I mean, I had no emotional or, or no religious baggage from any other church or nothing. I, didn't, I knew nothing. I was like, a, nothing. And um, it really changed my outlook on a lot of things. And I was able to look back on life. And this is a question for you in your, in your walk of faith. Did you find a point where you're like, oh, crap, this is real. This is it. And then what I found when I found that point, I looked back in my life and found a little touch points where I'm like, yep, should have been dead there. Yep. He was stepped in here. Yep. This person needed to leave my life at that point because look at what happened afterwards. Do you, did you have similar experiences? And is there anything you'd like I to do. share about that? I mean, like my faith, you know, like I'm going through some stuff right now, you know, and like. It's no coincidence that I, I mean, I'm not doing this alone. I've got some recoveries taught me one thing. I've got some men in my life that will, I can walk through anything with, you know, like my that's first, awesome. you know, like my mom, that's one of the things I'm majorly going through right now. Right, my mom yeah. just suffered a massive stroke. Um, yeah, that's she's hard. totally paralyzed on one side of her body. Um, I live here in Washington state. We're dealing with, um, I don't want to get too deep into politics, but the politics here are stupid and because of <laughs> because of their mandates. I can't even go in the hospital and see my mom right now. Right. So I, I put a lot of this in God's hands. Right. And I'm like, and this is the same woman that went to church every Sunday and prayed for her son. You know, like mm -hmm. that. 
and you know, towards the end of my addiction, she would actually pray that maybe I just get that phone call that he's dead or that he's going to go away to prison this time because mm-hmm. she was tired of worrying. And then right. my occupation isn't a whole lot better on family. <laughs> yeah, friends, yeah. Right? no like, kidding. Exactly. You leave drug addiction and oh, well, he's safer when he's on the boat in one of the most deadly occupations in the world. <laughs> yeah, you know, right. like, at least My we goodness. know where he's at. And if he dies up there, well, at least there's uh, uh, some honor in it, I guess. You know, so there's there's parts of my life that with my faith, there's no way I walk through this alone. You know, like I sh- like you said, Ken should have been dead a thousand times over. I mean, my motorcycle's right in front of me on this screen. And, you know, I, I push the envelope on her all the time. And, and Right. You know, I'm not going to say I- every time I turn the ignition on, but just about there's a quick prayer. Let me and my wife make this ride safely. Let us cross state lines safely. You know, here's, and, here's a cool part with, with what you're saying. Um, I ride too. And uh, you really, you, it is your life. Every time you, you, you leave your driveway with the thing. And I've, I've had a crash. My crash was from doing stupid stuff and wheelies and burnouts. And I, I went out <laughs> and but, you know, I find myself quite often as I'm just riding down the road, I'll just notice something or there will be a smell or I roll, I roll out of the valley and you come up and, it, and you feel the warm air and the cool air as you're going through. You don't get this in a car, folks. I mean, no. You feel the difference in temperature from a hill, you know, and every hill is a little bit different. And you find yourself out really in nature flying. And, um, you know, I often audibly i just say i'll be driving along into the sunset or something and just look at this and just i'll thank god i'll be like i'm an artist i uh yeah i draw i paint i do all kinds of stuff and i so i really noticed this and this is like my mean someone says this how do you how do you prove it i'm like well look look at this look at this absolutely incredible painting that somehow some of us can recreate and and uh how, how did that get in there how did this all happen this didn't happen from two atoms touching together two billion years ago this is yeah. This was, this was a creation. I have to think that way. And, um, on a motorcycle, you notice that and riding, we've never had a chance to ride together. Another fun thing. I've been going to Sturgis since 1999. Never once have I gone for fun. I've always been working. (laughs) So (laughs) it's awesome working at Sturgis. And I'm like, well, yeah. Like when I met you, you know, it was, you came in a time where it wasn't super, super busy, which was great. So we had a time to BS a little bit. But, uh, you know, we're working from eight in the morning till eight at night is when the doors are open. Now yeah. we were busy. So most nights we're there to 11 and then you go eat and they go to bed and you wake up the next morning and come right, to- right back at it. That's that trade show life. Yep. And you it's know? hard. It is hard. And uh, that that year was cool. My son got to come and he had lost, uh, you know, 2020. He, he turned 18 in April. Not, couldn't do anything then. And then, you know, the prom was canceled. Graduation was canceled. They wouldn't let him do anything. His job went away because they had to close the store. You know, and so I said, hey, you want to come to Sturgis and work the booth and work the trailer? He's like, hell yeah. So <laughs> here we did. Awesome. And we get to meet we'll you. Some time and- yeah. And, <laughs> and, you know, one of the things that we got to talk about there, which was kind of cool, and I'm going to kind of shift gears into some of your, your, your other business now, your business that you're working sure. on, is... um the whole, the vaping e-cig kind of whole world. Uh, my, like I said, I smoked for many, many years. I was a two pack a day camel lights. And um, I, it was, I quit before the vaping thing really got, took off. And uh, a friend of mine that had had a beat heroin addiction told me that cigarettes was harder to quit than heroin. And I didn't believe him, but it, it is. I mean, I, I had gone at times three years and I then jumped back. I can to that. Yeah. <laughs> But he said he gave me the best day is the day I'm done doing heroin. I'm sick for four days and I'm done. Yeah. And like, that's it. And the, yeah, there's cravings and other stuff. And man, go to jail for 60 days. No cigarettes, no heroin. Oh. The first thing you do is you head straight for the convenience store to get yep. a pack of cigarettes. And from that first drag, I'm back to two packs, man. Yeah, like, exactly. Easily. Like I could stay off the heroin for a few weeks, getting out of jail, but that <laughs> yeah. damn cigarette. Yeah. Well, he, he gave me the best advice. He said, and, and this is what worked for me. You know, you never know what's going to really work. You know, you have to find that thing that's going to make it so that you can make the, make the choice. And he said, he said to me, he says, well, when you're going to have a cigarette, this is how you quit. When you're going to have a cigarette, just don't have that. 
And it's not, don't not. have any more. Don't, don't stop smoking. It's just when you're going to have one, just don't have it. Don't. Just don't do it. And that's what I did. And that and I was like, wow, well, okay. You know, I was pissy for a few weeks and, and uh, you know, no fun to be around, but it, I got past it. And, you know, it's, it's been probably, I don't know, six, eight years now. And uh, that's, you know, that's fantastic. But my wife was the one that was, she was like, I'm going to quit smoking. And she'd go an hour, hour and a half before she had to grab a pack, go out and buy a pack and smoke the whole thing and just be, then feel bad about herself and all this. When the e-cigs came out, she was like, okay, wait a minute. The, the, the mental, the mind screw that you have. Get that on, hand to mouth. <laughs> hand to mouth thing. And you're getting the nicotine. And she got in there and she got the nicotine and she, this was a godsend to her. And, and this was why I'm, I'm really pro e-cigs, that whole, that whole world. I'm, I'm, I'm really pro uh, advocate for it because it, it got her to quit smoking, which would have killed her. And, you know, she has asthma and different things. And her doctor's like, you got to quit. Of course, doctors are going to say that. But she went to the doctor and says, well, I'm doing this e-cig thing. And it took her six or eight months and she weaned down to, there was no more nicotine. So she didn't need it as much. And she was able to just stop it all and quit. And she wouldn't have been able to do that if it wasn't for, for, for the vaping community. And yeah. they were super supportive about it. Every store they went to. And it's a, it's a shame to see, you know, again, just to give a little heck here, have some government moment. It's a shame to see the government coming down and cracking down on something. That's probably the single best cure for so, so many different been, addictions. It's a consumer based product and an end to the tobacco industry 480 million people a year what is it 400 oh normally i got all these statistics right in my head <laughs> Forty-eight thousand people a year dying of smoking related diseases in the united states alone right you know, they still haven't found anything wrong with these no know? they have they, and they've been trying and i have um another friend of mine uh they did some paint work for on his car they, they owned a shop that they sold pipes and things like that and, you know, essential oils and, you know, they got into the e-cigs and, and whatnot. And the amount of, of taxes, they were taxing some of these, that some of these uh, substances that were completely legal at 90% tax. I mean, how, they're, they're trying the to tax it margin right out of it, you know, and that's kind of where we are in Washington state, you know, like that's yeah, going to be hard. I started my e-cigarette business my god man this is hard one of my good friends bought these little e-cigarette starter kits he's buying five at a time online mm -hmm. and selling them at the 12-step meetings and um, my wife bought one from him and i tried it i didn't really like it but i was was making it a habit you know i'm gonna give this a go right the devices weren't that good and um uh, you know, the hard part about this is he just passed away about two weeks ago from. Oh, sorry to hear that. Those. So, you know, uh, it's crazy how the world, how the world spins. But back then me and him were, I don't want to say we had a pissing contest. If I bought something, he bought something shinier. We both had right. a little bit of money, you know, and, and uh, I love the guy dearly, you know? And so, I sat down with one of my daughters. I've got five of them, right? And I said, hey, do you draft this email up for your dad? So I sent the company. Um, it was a European-based company called Totally Wicked. And I sent them a, a, an email kind of stating, hey, this is Matt Bradley from the TV show Deadliest Catch. I was wondering if you guys have ever sponsored anybody. What I'm willing, I can't promise I'll ever get your product on TV, but if you send me hats, T-shirts, stuff like that, I can get you promotional photos and I'll give you shout outs on so my social media platforms. This is the numbers that I get when I'm doing stuff like this. Nobody likes cigarettes. It'll probably be a good fit for both of us. Sincerely, Matt Bradley. Next thing I know, they sent me enough stuff for everybody on the boat. <laughs> Hundreds yeah, well, why, why not? Toys, hundreds right. of devices, coils, everything one would need to, to quit smoking using that device. And so I did what I said I would do. I put some posts out there on social media, you know, thank you, Totally Wicked, for helping me quit smoking. Um, I was very honest about it. I went from four packs to two packs down to one pack. 
um, just like we were talking about. It's hard right. to make transition, you know? And I got it all the way down to half a pack of cigarettes a day and using the vapor product the rest of the day. And uh, somewhere in the mix of all this, somebody saw my post and asked me if I would fly out to uh, Ohio and do a grand opening of a vapor store. And I was like, you have a whole store of this stuff? <laughs> yeah, I suppose like, you didn't I realize. I only thought you could buy this stuff online. When was Are this time wise, timeline wise? Uh, this was eight years ago. So okay. pretty new at that point. Nine, nine years ago now. Yep. And uh, so I flew out to Ohio. I got there. I, the guy had five other stores. And we went to each one of his stores. I did a little autograph session at one and then the next one. And then everybody gets to come meet me um, at the grand opening of this new store. And I watched this man so calmly open this store and kind of given a little bit of direction. I had no idea what all this stuff was. And I asked him a dollar amount. What does all this cost? Mm -hmm. By the time it was done, I said, I want $20,000 worth. Wow. And I came home and my wife's like, what did you do? I, said, <laughs> I took notes. I wrote things down. I took a handful of pictures. I went and bought a camera. Um, I sat and listened to the customers. I talked to his staff. I had never opened a business like this. You know, I'd seen lots of friends have construction businesses, plumbing, electrical, right. car detailing. You know, I had a good working knowledge of a business. Um, more was going to be revealed. That's for sure. Um, I took that first handful of product and I sold it out of the house. Right. Right. Yeah. And I would put some in the truck and go to a 12 step meeting, sell some there. All my friends were starting to use it. The only place in Washington to buy it was three hours away wow. and it was a small shop and their inventory was smaller than what I had on my kitchen table. <laughs> And so it was like, I hate to say it, but it was just like hustling drugs, man. I had a pocket full of money. I was moving it. People were coming to my house. Neighbors were like, you sure have a lot of traffic. You know, like, <laughs> people were calling, can I get some of that strawberry 24? Do you, do, oh, I tried somebody's bubble gum. Uh, <laughs> delish. Um, do you have any of that? I was like, yeah, I got three bottles left. Oh, I got to re up, you know, mm -hmm. it was, uh, that's kind of how it started. And then, I partnered with somebody because my credit, uh, and mind you, I'm two years sober at the time. Sure. Uh, my credit is still in the dumps. Um, I hadn't rented an apartment, a house, anything in over 10 years. Part of that addiction piece of my life is I just, I lived in motels for right. 15 years to come home. I never had a place. I had one apartment through all through my 20s. I don't think I hung on to that for more than a year <laughs> amazing you know so basically just a gypsy in between seasons you know right. so then we we opened our first retail location i opened it on a friday night and i got it on an airplane saturday morning and went fishing you're kidding so I you're gone for wife, five months what's that you're gone for five so you opened the store and then and then you opened you're... the store and was gone for five months <laughs> and i called i told my wife and said i don't know what i got to send you just run this thing Monday to Friday, keep it closed Saturday, Sunday. You now have a job. Um, I hope this works out, but we got a lot of money invested in this. And She's a saint. It, yeah. And so my, her, my wife and my business partner and his wife were all partnered up. They ran that store. Um, my business partner is an iron worker by trade. So it ended up just being the two girls. Sure. They got pretty tired of being there every day. We weren't yeah. making, we weren't pulling a paycheck, you know, both of us men were, you know, paying our normal bills with fishing money and iron working. And right. But we kept investing in the store. We'd buy more product, we'd buy shinier lights, better show cabinets, just kept throwing money back into it. And the stores started opening up around us, but we'd already, we'd already hit the niche. We yeah, already had the first. customer base. We yep. knew what we were doing. And then like, taking that TV show notoriety. Mind you, this is an up and coming industry. Right. And some of the companies, the girls are like, all the customers are coming in. They're buying this online. They're driving back down to Tacoma. 
they won't sell us this brand or that brand because we don't have enough employees or we don't have enough social media presence. And I was right. all That's crazy. Who did we talk to? I get on the phone. Hey, this is Matt Bradley from Deadliest Catch. You ever watch the show? <laughs> no. Yeah, actually, it's one of my favorite shows. And well, you know, Google my name real quick, and and then that's who you're talking to. And then now they're like, well, how did you get my number? I was like, well, my wife gave it to me and said you wouldn't sell us product. I love it's it. Ridiculous. <laughs> I love you know, it. your MOQs are too high. I can't buy 500 bottles. I'm a small shop. I, I need a hundred. Right. And they'd be like, we're going to sell you a uh, hundred bottles. We're going to give you 20 bottles and uh, give them 20 bottles away. And uh, you now have a contract with us. <laughs> Come out of the office. Hey girls, uh, they, they sold to us. It should be here two, three days time. Yeah. Oh, they'd be mad, but happy in the same extent, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. It's it, those kind of things with the, the doors, <laughs> you know, you had, you, you, I don't find people are lucky, you know, it's luck is just seeing an opportunity and be able to work with it. So, you know, the opportunity you have, there was a whole, remember the whole motorcycle thing too, you know, there was Jesse James and the OCC and the right. biker build-offs and some of that, you know, I know most of these guys and a lot of them really weren't able to grasp that in that, that little 15 minutes of fame and, and run with it. You know, they're, they're running their shops and they're successful and they're doing their deal. But you no, know, some people really took like Jesse James took it and ran with it. You yeah. know, he sold his company for $50 million. That was a, that was a pretty, that's a pretty shrewd deal. Orange yeah. County choppers was doing about 80 million a year. Yep. In merchandise. Yeah. In, in merchandise. I don't in know fails. what they were bringing in from that, but that's key change t-shirts, boxer briefs. Yeah. Socks stupid motorcycle trinkets 80 million in sales is nothing to laugh at I don't right know. right and all that from a tv show that i liked in the beginning <laughs> yeah in the beginning well ha- ha- i've worked in shops so a little bit of my history um i got out of school i got a design a, a job in a design firm right away it lasted four months till i got my ass fired and then i dove right into playing in a blues band i worked in the toy industry like making molds for sculptors that were sculpting action figure guys. But I ended up at a, um, uh, a, a body shop that built custom cars and custom bikes. And this guy, Bruce, Bruce Bush from wizard custom studios, he actually passed away um, not too long ago, but he took me under his wing and kind of showed me the, the ways of, you know, this is how the automotive paint works. This is how you weld, you know, cause I knew how to weld with an acetylene torch, but, He's like, this is how you wire feed. This is how you mold up, mold up a frame for a chopper. This is how we put a quarter panel on a 72 Buick Riviera. You know, that the, the nuts and bolts of just working in a shop. And I did that for, for many years. And it was like <laughs> the stuff you learn in, in how it just changes. I, I lost my train of thought where I was going with this, but <laughs> it was, you know, it's just one thing after another of, of learning, stepping up, moving to the next level, seeing how the business works. Um, we had an investor at one point that wanted to come in and throw a lot of money at this and make it like a Boyd Coddington chip foos kind of shop. And I saw it and I was like, Oh, this is going to be awesome. This is my big break. I finally have done it. But the guy that I was working with at the time didn't see it that way. He was, he, he was like, Oh, it's going to destroy what the shop is and the integrity of what we're doing and all that. So it, we ended up parting ways on that. And he kept his shop going for many years after that. And I, I moved on and ended up um, d- as a, as a product designer for Kuryakin. And I worked there for 11 years designing, I don't know, hundreds of products. And then me and you met Chris that was there too. And yeah. uh, Arrow, Arrow Rudd and uh, a couple other guys, we, we all started Ciro in 2014 with nothing with zero products and just ideas and let's get crazy and do some stuff. And we had, there was backing there. So, I mean, there were, financially, we weren't really having to struggle, but it was still, we have zero products, you know, we, and we need a whole product line. And by, by Sturgis 2015, we had 150 parts that we launched with. And uh, that was, that was a pretty exciting time. And, you know, when I met you last year, you know, that, that was, it, it took many years to get the thing going. People like, oh yeah, well, it must be nice. I'm like, well, no, it was, we didn't make any money for years. I mean, years you know we and like you said you pour it back in 
And, you know, we're still doing that to grow. It's just, that's what we're doing. And we just, we just want to make cool stuff. You know, that's all I want to do. I want to make cool stuff, make people happy. I want Matt to be able to look at his bike and go, that is a pretty cool light. You know, I, I do. It's pretty, it's pretty crazy. Like I'll be on different, I want dozens of different motorcycle forums. And yeah, I see you guys as product here and there. Somebody's like, oh, I'm looking for this. Especially with my wife's trike. I'm like, oh, you should check out the Ciro freeway pegs. They're great. She's a short legger and she can reach them. Yeah. You know, and they, I'm looking at them right now. They look great. <laughs> well, I appreciate <laughs> that. You know? Yeah, exactly. And it, you know, with uh, the motorcycle industry, we, we, COVID, the only thing that was good about COVID is it gave the motorcycle industry a boost. It got a lot of people on two wheels riding because it was, you know, the ultimate That's social freedom. distancing. Yeah, yeah. It's freedom. And you could finally go out and ride. And then you realize, well, you know what? I could use this or I could use that or maybe some more light. And, um, you know, that's just, that's all awesome stuff. So, you know, it's cool that uh, you're riding. Hopefully one of these times when you're, we can meet up at one of these rallies, we can go for a cruise somewhere and go Absolutely. have a steak or something. And I feel bad about this last year. You know, we were supposed to go out to Sturgis this year now. Well, you got sick. Man, that's right. Man, two days before I was supposed to leave, I was like, God, I've had a headache for two days. I got the sniffles. I don't feel so good. I hope I ain't got the Rona. Ah, I'll be fine. My buddy's <laughs> wife, you should probably go get tested. No, I don't want to be part of the statistics. Right. Okay, I'll go get tested. Oh, I before the results even came back, I knew I had it. That mm-hmm. stuff laid me down for 14 days, you know? Yeah. And, and That's I a serious deal. My favorite event of the year. You know? Right. And we and missed having you out there. It's the Sturgis event. It's the adventure of getting there. You yeah. know, it's a three day ride. I've done it in two. I will never do that to my wife or do it again in two days. Unless That's a hell of a ride in two days. Yeah. Holy That's a lot of smashing. <laughs> Holy That's crap, dude. The whole way, you know. Yeah, that's full on, man. And doing it in three days, you pick out a couple of nice hotels, you get in the hot tub, you swim in the pool, you relax, you get some dinner, and you get up and ride again, you know. Right. And like we were talking about, you get to the smells, the sights, it's all there. Your sensors are on overload. And I i don't mean nothing bad about Wyoming until you get to Wyoming. <laughs> There's a lot of Wyoming, isn't there? It it's just keeps like, slow. it's like, you got to just keep going and going. It's like, are we ever getting out of this state? And there's cool <laughs> things to see in Wyoming too. But that last time we went through there, it was fields, oil fields and I don't know. And it was just hot. It was super, super hot. For At me, one point, I looked over, I was riding behind my wife, and I was like, where are her feet? They were up on her on her handlebars. <laughs> she's just trying to get away from the engine. It's just no corners. It's straightaways. Oh, it's hot, she's too. She's steering with her feet and her legs up on her tank. I was like, it doesn't really look safe, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and for us, coming from coming from the east side, you know, when you hit, you know, you get down on onto I ninety going west towards, uh, you know, the, the Black Hills. It's, there's nothing for no four hundred miles. It's I ninety. It's a highway. Like, it's, it's nothing for four hundred miles. Truck and trailer. Not a whole lot of sights to be seen. Right, right. So that year that I went out, we actually drove out. Um, in uh, I've got a nineteen ninety seven Lincoln Town Car. And oh, I've seen, seen pictures. I've of seen it. pictures yes. of it. I mean, my dad bought it new. It's been in Arizona in a garage all its life, and I got it in 2015. And we took that out. And you know, you're not even fatigued. It was a nine hour drive. My son and I, we pounded it to get out there. It, you're not even fatigued. You get out, and you're like, all right, what do we gotta do now? <laughs> you know, it's a little different than riding on a motorcycle. Yeah. But anyway, so let me see what uh, what else we got. So I think we've gone over most of what I wanted to talk about. We're um What's next for you? What what you so you've got your store? How many stores you have? And tell me a little bit about those. Okay. So right now, you know, we've uh, let's just say Matt's a big advocate for the industry for the vapor. Matt's a big advocate for the vapor industry. We started with that one store. We've always donated time and money to local advocacy. Um, um, we were talking earlier about not having a care in the world about politics until you own your own business, especially yeah. something that is under fire, like the vapor industry. Mm-hmm. We've been through things like vaping's killing people when it was actually bad THC carts. Um, right. 
very people lost their lives and I, and for that i'm sorry but it was not the e-cigarette industry that did that it was homemade bad marijuana right mm-hmm. and it actually killed some people we've been through things like the popcorn long um millions of different smear campaigns coming from tobacco free this company uh harm reduction companies that have that are backed by big tobacco there's right there's a bigger there's a bigger play at this than anyone could ever see. And you get to see politics and who's getting paid and who's not getting paid. You know, the yep. cigarette industries pay states um, for cigarette sales. Um, it's the master settlement agreement. Mm-hmm. If you don't know about the master settlement agreement, look it up on YouTube. It's there's very informative videos out there that when the state gets money, they spend it on bearer bonds and they move that money around and they count on that money. And all of a sudden the vapor industry came in and tobacco sales took a plummet. And when they're taking a plummet, then the, ta- the state's not getting its money. So now they got to tax it. And right. We beat the taxes here in Washington state. We beat a lot of different things because people like myself went to the state capital four mm-hmm. and five, six, eight, ten times during a session to get things thrown out or get lines, <clears throat> you know, have a lobbyist there in our favor. So we're here in the back end of what they're drafting up on bills. Right, and right. Bills squashed, you know. And that's what, uh, to jump in, that's where political advocacy will actually make a difference. It does. You know, it's not, it's, you, you think know, your voice isn't heard. Well, it's not unless you're being active in it. Yeah. You and know? you got to, it's not just go down once. And, you know, I get a, a, I just moved from Minnesota to Wisconsin because of a lot of it was because of the politics of what's been going on in Minnesota. It was crappy. But I was an, uh, I'm a gun advocate. I'm, I'm, I'm as Second Amendment as you can get. I'm, my, my goal is to abolish all gun laws, all of them. If I, want an, if I want a tank and you should have a tank, if I want a missile, I should have a missile. I'm not saying you can afford one. I'm not saying there can't be some kind of regulation, but I'm just, I'm that guy. So I fought really hard in Minnesota back when we were doing the, the concealed carry thing. And when we, when other gun laws and stuff would come up, I worked with some of these groups here in town where we'd pack eight, 900 people at the state Capitol into these committee rooms when there was having hearings. Well, that, that makes a difference, it but does. a lot of these guys will have a, a you know, a, you know, there'll be like a, a prayer protest of of for uh, abolishing abortion or something like that, which, you know, uh, OK, but you're there on a Saturday with 75 people out in front. First of all, there's nobody in the building at all. Yeah. And if you're not in there with paperwork showing them this and having a crowd of people that are actually not yelling and screaming, they don't care about that. They care about people that are like, we're going to vote you out. This is it. And this is this is that this is this is the bill that we're talking about. No, this yellow, this is you. And we know this. And we're we're telling our friends and our advocates, and we'll change this. And that's what people need to do is get more involved in that end of it if they want. But moreover, I think I pivoted. I got out of politics in like 2018 in being a you know, working on campaigns, and I jumped right into I want to build. Um, I want to build our company more. I want to build Ciro uh, to be as big as it can be. I want to build my own art business as big as it can be, because eventually I'm 53, you know, in 10 years, I'm going to be near retirement and I'm never going to retire, but I want to, <laughs> no. I want, I want to just make art the rest of my life. So I'm, I'm starting to build a, uh, an art empire to take over the world. And then I'll do that. And you're in. <laughs> so I, I, I actually found one of the things I found was this nomad network. I don't know if you listen to any podcast, other podcasts, there's one that uh, Jason Stapleton did. And he's anyway, it was a long story short. He started a, a, a network for entrepreneurs, kind of a mastermind network that I joined early on. And it's uh, it's been really cool. And I've met a lot of great people And that. Um, my last podcast that I did, uh, I sent you this morning was with Amy Nichols. I met her on there. And uh, just it's a cool place, but I can talk about that later. But anyway, I don't know. Do you have anything you want to plug? Anything coming up? Anything uh, before we before we go? Yeah, let me let me wrap this out. And then if you cut it, it gets in there. You know, sure. so you know. Once again, we we started with the one store. Um, we moved into a second and third location. By the time we had our third location, we had uh, come up with our own e liquid line. I kind of themed it after after Deadliest Catch and used the likeliness of uh, 
one of the boats on the show. We made a three flavor line. Um, then somewhere in the midst of all that, you know, we, we were talking about politics. Two years ago, they put a flavor ban in here in Washington State, said we could not sell any flavored vapor products. Yeah, it was going to be a three-month period. At the same day, they announced the tax was to go in effect. So this is a 60-milliliter bottle. Every okay. time I put one of these on my shelf, this is actually... I don't know if you all can see that, but you know oh, this, cool. is, this is one of my uh, one of my flavors. It's called Rock and Seas. It's a red, white, blue popsicle. So they put that tax in place, and the tax had been running for three days. On the fourth day, they put the flavor ban in. They just hit us out of the blue with the flavor ban. Wow! I had to take inventory off of my shelves, put it in my stock room. And then they said it couldn't be on premises. Well, it stayed in the stock room for another day. And I had met some guys who have, or that are on tribal land. Oh, sure. I made a partnership with them, with my other business partners and said, look, we need a retail space immediately. This flavor ban's in effect. We blew through thousands of dollars worth of product. People stocked up. They bought as many bottles as they possibly could. Right. Most of them had a week to a two-week supply. We have about two weeks to figure this out. They also, at that same time, killed online sales into Washington State. Somewhere in the mix of all this, once again, I got the retail location space on tribal land, and I was on an airplane. Looked at my <laughs> wife. I did it to you again. My business <laughs> partner, Scott Donnell, I'm sorry. We did it again. I got to go. Right. Because I didn't know it was going to work. I mean, I had a good idea it would work. But for three months, we operated two locations, just barely. The third one, we had to close. It couldn't survive the flavor ban. The costs were too high. We mm -hmm. had to break the retail lo lease location. That cost about 20 grand just to get out of the lease alone. Without wow. having that hanging over our head. We had the one little store. And mind you, this is 300 square feet. Wow. And yeah, that's we nice, small. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still operating today. We have now opened a really nice location on, on tribal land, and we kept the little one. So we have both of them going. Um, that's the one that got last. It has been three days. We got broken into again. You know, kids, I saw kids that. across the doors, and we're not on film or recording i'll tell you all about that yeah. pretty rough man you know but we managed to beat the state at their own game right they didn't have those taxes now they can't tax me on tribal land so i'm not having to pay that state tax and i got down so now i've got four locations running and, and it's uh you know getting down to the the knit and grit and things of running this business it's under fire all the time at state and federal levels, about as bad as guns are. I hate to categorize the two, but I own lots of friends that own gun stores. And Similar the stuff problems. They yeah. have to deal with the laws, the rules, just how secure things have to be, what they have to do just to stay in operations right. is insane. It is absolutely insane. And this product here, you know, the vapor industry. It's a consumer-based product. It's the solution to the tobacco problem. Like we've we've single-handedly won, you know. And in the state of Washington, when that flavor ban went into place, 250 businesses all went out of business. There's 250 vapor licenses that surrendered wow. in that three-month period. There's people it's like myself that I people. always worked. You know, yeah. I kept my commercial fishing job. If I had had to rely on just the vapor industry, I wouldn't have never survived. Right. Not, not, not financially. The company would have survived. I would have. <laughs> well, and, you know, this is good because to put a face on it makes a difference because when these stores are closing, same thing happened in Minnesota last year when they shut the, when they, when the shutdowns came. 95% tax, man. They killed it you was, guys out it there. It was killed it. And then, and then they, um, when they did the restaurant thing for COVID, they shut down all the restaurants <laughs> and um, you know, God, it just did the people that got just thrown out of work that are just good, hardworking people that like their, they like their gig at the restaurant and they're working hard. 
and it, it's terrible. I just, I hate that. So, but I think what you're doing is, is a, is a story of, uh, um, it's, it's an, a story of inspiration, I guess, because you, no matter what's thrown it's at a you, David and Goliath type thing, yeah. it really is. And no matter what's thrown at you, you, you're just, you're literally just standing up and saying, no, I'm going to no, find a no, way around yeah. this. Do what you're going to do. I'm going to find a way around this because I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to beat this. I feel the same way. So we're kindred spirits in that, in that aspect. But, well, I'll tell you what, I really appreciate you coming on here. And, um, yeah. you know, I, I uh, we've been going for a little bit over an hour now, and I have a feeling you and me could go for another two hours if we, we <laughs> dig into it. But uh, so, again, Matt Bradley, Deadliest Catch. What's what's your store's name out there? Are they all the same? Or are they uh, Sky Vapor. Sailor Sky. Sky Vapor, the two on the Raz, and then uh, just Sky Vapor. You Google Sky Vapor, you'll find us. <laughs> awesome. So, and make, be sure to check out your, uh, your Facebook page is awesome, by the way. It, it's a lot of fun. So Matt Bradley on Facebook and, uh, again, thanks for being on here. Thanks for watching the show. Thanks and for having me, Ken. I anytime. I enjoy this. Oh yeah. I hope so too. Well, thanks so